right, we are now live and streaming on YouTube. Ah, all right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Science Colloquium. We will be starting our program at 3.15. All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Science Colloquium. We will be starting. All right, I thought that was muted earlier when I signed in early. That's why we are in here early. Hi, and welcome um, to Science Colloquium, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to start our um, talk today in just a few minutes. I did want to tell you about a Modesto Area Partners in Science event this Friday. This is going to be a virtual event. And Dr. Greg Stock, Yosemite National Park's first geologist, he's the park geologist, and he will be speaking this Friday on the rise and recent fall of Sierra Nevada glaciers. And this will be through the Great Valley Museum YouTube channel, so you can actually Google Great Valley Museum YouTube and find their channel. And there's actually a link already ready for this event. Um, during this event, Dr. Stock will be discussing how glaciers have played an essential role in shaping the Sierra Nevada and explain why the impending loss of these glaciers will likely have ripple effects throughout the high elevations of Yosemite. Um, so, for today, we are going to have Joy Bisset. Am I pronouncing your name right? I'm so sorry. I should have asked earlier. Okay, thank you. Awesome. So, Denise, I'm going to hand it over to you to do the introductions. Okay. Hi, well. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Denise. I'm the bot. And, and I'm on the Science Colloquium Committee. And Joy Bachet became the director of the Merced Vernal Pool and Grass Plant Preserve in March 2020. She directs and implements land stewardship, research, education, and outreach activities. Previously, she had the pleasure of working at New Summerton National Park for 18 years which is where the geology speaker from Matt is also from in several capacities, including restoration and plant ecology, watershed, trail system, and wilderness management. Most recently, as an applied wetland ecologist, she oversaw wetland and rain plant ecological research, monitoring, and management. She grew up in the Davis area. She is a longtime nature enthusiast her college education began at American River College, which is in Roseville, near Sacramento. She received her AA there. It was at American River College that she first discovered her passion for environmental science when she took a physical geography class and also spending her free time studying and recreating on the banks of the American River. She went on to obtain her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science, Watershed Science Focus from Humboldt State University. And then she got her Master's in Science in Environmental System, Wetland Ecology Focus from UC Merced, where she now works. She began there in March 2020. As a plant and wetland ecologist, 
She is a member of North American Auctioneer and the California Plant Society and the Society of Wetland Scientists. As a longtime California resident and outdoor enthusiast, in her spare time, she enjoys camping, backpacking, hiking, skiing, biking, rock climbing, and paddleboarding with her family, which includes her husband and two children. In the mountains, foothills, coast, and desert, depending upon the time of the year and activity. And so with that introduction, I will turn this over to Joy Boucher. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you, Liz. And I encourage you all to check out uh, Dr. Greg Stock's talk. He's a wonderful speaker, and I really enjoyed the years that I got to work with him at Yosemite National Park. So with that, I will go ahead and share my screen and start my presentation. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. As mentioned, I'm Joy Bechet, the director of the Merced Vernal Pool and Grassland Reserve, or MVPGR for short. And Denise, can you see my screen okay before I get started? Yeah, I can see it. You're good Great, to go. Great, thank you. Good, so today I'd like to share with you a little bit about the reserve's vernal pool ecology, biodiversity and endemism, as well as current stewardship, research, education, and public service um, in our grand vision for the future. Just one moment to fix one thing, great, okay. But first I'll start with a little introduction about the reserve's local context, um, history and mission. As you can see by the map, the MVPGR is a star location in that it's a unique natural reserve um, located directly adjacent to a major UC campus. And the 6,500 acre reserve is unique, not only due to its close proximity to a major UC campus, but also due to the fact that it represents some of the largest vernal pool and grassland ecosystems of its kind in the world, which is impressive given that we've lost over 90% of our vernal pool habitat in California. And the reserve serves as strict conservation lands for the UC Merced campus. And it also serves as a natural reserve that is a part of the UC natural reserve system. And the property became a part of the, of the natural reserve system in 2014, which I'll tell you a little bit more about next. So the MVPGR is a part of a growing network of four UC Merced natural reserves and field stations as part of the natural reserve system or NRS, whose mission is to contribute to the understanding and wise stewardship of the earth and its natural systems by supporting university level teaching, research and public service. And these four sites provide rich opportunities for connecting communities in the Central Valley, Foothills and the Sierra Nevada mountain region. And two of these sites are officially within the UC Merced Natural Reserve System. That's the uh, Vernal Pool Reserve, as well as the Yosemite Field Station in Yosemite National Park and then the Sequoia Field Station in Sequoia National Park, as well as the Sycon Field Station in Springville um, are both a part of UC Merced, but not yet a part of the natural reserve system. So the natural reserve system is a statewide network that includes 41 natural reserves and field stations throughout the state of California and represents the largest university administered reserve system of its kind in the world. And reserve locations represent California's major ecosystems ranging from coastal environments, let me go back to that slide, um, grasslands and mountain ecosystems that can be used as living laboratories to learn about and investigate our natural world. And now that I've given you a brief introduction, next I'd like to tell you a little bit about the reserve's um, vernal pool ecology. The reserve is quite special in that it has some of the greatest density of vernal pools in the Central Valley. 
And the map shown on the right depicts the various vernal pool regions remaining throughout the state, where you can see the San Joaquin Valley region shown in tan here uh, with the gold star depicting the location of the reserve. And vernal pools are amazing ecosystems in that they have unique plant communities, distinct assemblages of invertebrates, including fairy shrimp, and a diverse array of geologic formations. Um, finally, vernal pools are hot spots for biodiversity, including plants and animals. And I'm just going to play this video here of a drone flyover of a vernal pool in spring. And the term vernal refers to spring, meaning that the vernal pools are a spring occurrence in terms of their showy flowering blooms. And you can see a large vernal pool in the background there. That's a playa pool, which is essentially a very large vernal pool. Um, so moving on. You might be wondering what exactly is a vernal pool? Vernal pools are essentially ephemeral wetlands, meaning that they're fleeting on the landscape. And the term vernal pool essentially refers to a seasonally wet area or wetland, which is some of my favorite ecosystems. And they occur in Mediterranean climates that have short wet winters and hot dry summers and form topographic depressional areas that fill with rainwater in winter uh, due to an underlying and permeable layer that doesn't allow rainwater to soak in, creating a perched water table. And here, here in the San Joaquin Valley, the vernal pools are underlain by a clay hard pan shown by this gray layer on the image here that's developed through sedimentation over millions of years, and that is impermeable to water percolation thus creating these rainwater pools. And in the San Joaquin Valley region, many of these rainwater fed vernal pools occur on very old soils that are two to five million years old and form what is known as Mima Mound topography, which are essentially a series of tightly formed small circular mounds found in grassland landscapes that have depressional areas between them. And these depressional areas um, are what fills with rainwater in the winter months, thus creating the vernal pools. And the Mima Mounds are actually a geologic mystery with over 30 different hypotheses and no clear consensus on what causes them. So hypotheses range um, from all kinds of reasons for their formation, like erosional um, causation, depositional, seismic, biologic, such as perhaps mammal burrowing and beyond. So there's been researchers at UC Berkeley who've studied Mima Mounds as well as other um, universities. Invernal pools also just um, undergo four distinct phases each year, depending on the season. In winter, in the wetting and aquatic phases, standing water is present as shown on the left side of this diagram here. In spring, during the drying phase or flowering phase, which is happening right now on the reserve, colorful plants and wildflowers abound. And in summer, during the drought phase, Conditions are quite dry as shown on the right where that clay hard pan would be just cracked soil. Um, and the vernal pools would be very hard to detect on the landscape if you didn't know what you're looking for. And all the annual plants that we would have seen in spring would have long gone dormant and dried out and desiccated. So this slide here depicts the artwork of Laura Cunningham, who was a PhD student at UC Berkeley on the left, who studied um, the history and kind of ethnobotany of the California landscape and is also a, a nature illustrator. And sh she really did, took a deep dive into looking at California's past and this photo um, here shows the various seasons of the vernal pools as depicted 
by Laura Cunningham, for example, vernal pool ecosystems were once widely distributed throughout California's Central Valley. However, habitat conversion from agriculture and urban development has been responsible for the destruction of what, what was once a quite large historical extent of vernal pool habitat. So the illustration on the bottom left depicts pronghorn elk that once made their home in vernal pool grasslands. Tule elk were also a common grazer in, in the grasslands, which were adapted to grazing. And the illustration on the top left depicts some of the migratory birds that continue to make their stops in vernal pools to this day, where the reserve has long been a stop along the Pacific Flyway, where we get a ton of birds using the uh, reserve along their long migratory journey. And then on the right, you see these images of the vernal pools in winter, spring, and summer. So now that I've shared a little bit with you about the reserve's vernal pool ecology, I'd like to share more with you about vernal pool biodiversity and endemism. The reserve is also considered a hot spot for biodiversity, where it's home to over 400 species of plants and animals, some of which are extraordinarily rare and found nowhere else in the world outside of the San Joaquin Valley. And these include fairy shrimp, burrowing owls, and California tiger salamanders, which are all threatened and endangered species in vernal pool and grassland habitats throughout the state. Um, but some more commonly encountered species include an abundance of migratory birds shown on the top left, other ground burrowing animals such as ground squirrels on the bottom middle, and of course cows shown on the bottom right, where we do maintain an active cattle grazing program on the reserve with the conservation goal of maintaining our native plant biodiversity by controlling some of the non-native annual grasses that were introduced to California as livestock forage during European settlement. And of these species, the very common ground squirrel, again shown on the top left, and other burrowing mammals for that matter, play a very important role as keystone species or ecosystem engineers, in that they create these vast networks of underground mammal burrows that you see on the right here, that are then used by all kinds of other animals, some of which are threatened and endangered, like the burrowing owl shown on the left in the middle and the California tiger salamander on the bottom, who use these burrows for shelter from predators such as raptors flying overhead, coyotes, or even snakes. We do have badgers on the reserve as well. And they're also shelter from the elements. So in grasslands, there's really not a lot of shrubs or trees to speak of. So the only places to seek shelter from the hot summer sun or predators um, would be these mammal burrows. So as mentioned, ground squirrels aren't the only important keystone species found in grassland. There's also Bada's pocket gopher, who's also responsible for creating these vast networks of mammal burrows that are then used by other species where these two species do abandon many of these burrows, which get adopted by other species like cottontail rabbits. And biologists have also found that these uh, burrows can have species coexistence of, of maybe, you know, ground squirrels coexisting right alongside one another with California tiger salamander, for example, without eating each other, which is really fascinating. So there are over 20 threatened and endangered species that live in and around California's vernal pools. And this image was created by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I think it does a great job at depicting some of these species, including the uh, conservation conservancy fairy shrimps uh, eggs, which you can see how small those are. And they're really interesting. Fairy shrimp eggs or cysts have a very tough polymer that is resistant to desiccation during the summer months and can really um, stay uh, dormant in soils for 
uh, a lot of years, no one really knows how long. There's also the vernal pool fairy shrimp, which prefer quite large vernal pools. The vernal pool tadpole shrimp, which is also endangered. California tiger salamander, which we mentioned, those can grow up to a foot long in size, as well as some plant species that are endemic to vernal pools, meaning they only occur in vernal pools and nowhere else in the world, such as orchid grass. And then there's some species that are a common vernal pool plants like meadow foam, some of which have locally rare subspecies. So the fairy shrimp is a small but otherworldly and even weird crustacean that live in vernal pools and have the ability to completely pause their metabolism to survive months or even years when the pools have dried up. And crustaceans are things like lobster or um, uh, shrimp, uh, crawdads, that sort of thing. And fairy shrimp can vary in size from maybe half of my pinky all the way to the length of my thumb. And during the dry season, these endangered fairy shrimp persist as sister eggs are in the soil. And during the wet season, eggs hash, hatch and the pools flourish with life. Um, the reserve also has a high floral diversity, which is my favorite thing to discuss as a plant ecologist especially in the vernal pools, where we've now recorded over 200 vernal pool plant species to date, some of which are common among vernal pools and some of which are both globally rare or endemic occurring only here in the San Joaquin Valley. So this image shows fiddlenecks on the left where we have over six species on the reserve, Calusa grass in the middle and succulent owls clover on the top middle, which are both uh, quite rare and more abundant vernal pool species, including meadow foam shown on the top right, that's the white flower, vernal pool monkey flower, that hot pink one on the right hand side, frying pan poppies on the bottom right, which are much smaller than the state flower, which is the California poppy. Down ninja shown on the bottom middle in that deep purple, they're about the size of my thumbnail. And wild hyacinth shown on the bottom left, which is a common grassland flower. And so the reserve in spring can be an amazing sight to behold when all these flowers are in bloom, but it also really depends on water year. In a big water year, you'll get a ton of showy flowering blooms. And then in a drought year, like what we're experiencing this year, it's a pretty quick uh, wildflower bloom season. So in vernal pools throughout the state of California, as I mentioned, ex experts have found that there are over 200 vernal pool species that have been recorded to date. And it was Michael Barber and Carol Witham who recorded some of those species. Michael Barber is out of UC Davis. And some of these are common among vernal pools, but again, some are quite uh, globally rare. And on the MVPGR, we found that we've recorded over 200 vernal pool and grassland species to date, of which 85 of those occur in wetlands and water bodies in general, and of which 35 only occur in and around vernal pools, making them endemic to these vernal pools uh, ecosystems. Of these species, about five of them are special status meaning that they're rare, threatened, or endangered species. And this one shown on the right here with the deep yellow in the middle and the white tips is tidy tips. That's a common um, springtime wildflower that you'll find in both grasslands and vernal pools. So just to give some example of some common vernal pool flora, we talked about meadow foam shown on the top left, who's uh, Latin genera is Limnanthes, and they're the first to bloom in the vernal pools. So you'll see those coming out first anywhere from late February to early March. Then there's calico flower or down ninja is its Latin name in the middle, which I mentioned are as tiny as a thumbnail. There's popcorn flower on the top right of which we have 17 species in and around vernal pools. There's larger species in the grasslands. Um, this one's vernal pool popcorn flower, which is much smaller. A lot of the vernal pool 
Um, flora are going to be very small in size, ranging from maybe the length of my thumb to the length of my hand, whereas species in grasslands could be a foot in size or maybe up to the height of your knee. Um, so coyote thistle is another one on this slide shown on the bottom left. It's Latin genera is Eryngium. And this one has an interesting life cycle uh, where it's more like a succulent in the aquatic and flowering phases. And then as uh, the vernal pools dry down, it becomes a much taller, dry, and very pokey shrub. In the bottom middle are gold fields. Um, which there's eight species throughout the state. And many say that gold fields are the reason why we refer to California as the golden state. In that in spring, um, in the past, you would see grasslands just carpeted in yellow from these gold field flowers. Another reason we might call California the golden state now is that we also have a lot of non-native annual grasses in our grasslands that dry down in the summer months um, where you see that tan gold colored uh, grassland. And then finally, there's woolly marbles on the bottom right, which is, are this light gray green marbled shape annual flower. An annual just means that they die down each year after flowering. And these are a type of cudweed in the daisy family. Their Latin genera is silicarpus. And as the spring months go on and summer comes, they dry up and desiccate and blow away in the wind um, when the summer winds come to the reserve. And that's the same for a lot of these flowers. So you wouldn't even know that they were ever there once the summer months come. Just to give a few more examples of some common vernal pool flora, there's butter and eggs on the top left. And this one's interesting in that it's semi-parasitic, meaning that it gets some of its nutrients from the roots of other nearby plants. There's white-tipped clover or trifolium shown on the top middle. And that is a facultative plant, meaning it occurs in both vernal pools and grasslands. There's mesa mint on the top right, whose Latin name is pagogeny, and it has a strong, pungent, minty smell, and it's sticky glandular to this touch. I found that a lot of vernal pool flora are often sticky glandular, which might be um, a special adaptation, uh, maybe to prevent herbivory, I'm not sure. There's vernal pool monkey flower, which is again that hot pink one shown on the bottom right. And they're responsible for some of the showiest colors that you see in vernal pools later in spring. Its Latin genera is diplicus. And then there's vernal pool brodea shown on the bottom right. That one's more of an uncommon species where the vernal pool variation is much smaller than its grassland cousin and it's much paler in color. And then some of the rare vernal pool flora that we have on the reserve that I'd like to highlight are shining navaricia shown on the left here, which has these tiny little yellow flowers and they look kind of like a little prickly pin cushion. There's Calusa grass in the middle or Neostaphsia. That's another one that is um, sticky glandular to the touch. So if you touched it, you'd have sticky fingers and it has this interesting pungent smell. Those like to grow kind of in mud flats of vernal pools and large playa pools. And then there's hog wallow starfish on the top right, which is Hesperivax. That's um, in the cudweed family as well. And it kind of looks like a starfish where you have this cluster of flowers in the middle and then these long kind of spoon shaped leaves that make it look like a starfish. And then on the bottom right is one of my favorites that's succulent owl's clover. It's in the Castilea family. And this little tiny flower only occurs in the San Joaquin Valley in three locations and nowhere else in the world. And the most robust population of that species is right here on our Merced Vernal Pools and Grassland Reserve. It can be confused with butter and eggs, which I had on this last slide here, but you can see the butter and eggs have red 
um, leaves, whereas the leaves of succulent owls, clover are green and fuzzy. Um, so a little bit different there. So moving on, now that you've heard about the reserve's vernal pool ecology, biodiversity, and endemism, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the reserve's stewardship, research, education, and public service as it relates to the UC Natural Reserve mission, which again is to contribute to the understanding and wise stewardship of the earth and its natural systems. So while the reserve is generally closed to the public and that it serves as strict conservation lands for the UC Merced campus that protects these sensitive wetland ecosystems and the threatened and endangered species therein, as part of the UC Natural Reserve system, the reserve facilitates use related to research, university level education, public outreach, including K through 12 groups and stewardship. And as you can see by, see by the pie chart shown here, over half of our use is attributed to university level education from course field trips shown in orange, followed by research shown in blue, stewardship in yellow, and finally public outreach in green which is kind of the smaller piece of the pie and we really hope to grow and expand upon that in the future. Uh, first and foremost, land stewardship will always remain at the core of what we do because it's a requirement of the conservation lands that predates the 2014 formal adoption of the MVPGR into the UC Natural Reserve System, but it's also a part of our UCNRS core values and missions. Hence, we will always work to continue to improve our current sustainable grazing practices shown by the cattle in the middle image, land management and monitoring of threatened and endangered and sensitive species we talked about, like fairy shrimp, succulent owls, clover, calusa grass. And we also wanna continue to improve our efforts of sustainable land management. So I also wanna mention that the MVPGR is also a place for impactful research where almost a third of our reserve use of which 80% is from UC Merced represents scientific research happening right here next to campus. And the reserve gets researchers from around the UC system and beyond visiting the reserve for ecology and biodiversity research opportunities in this amazing living laboratory setting. And the reserve's already a great place for exciting research that's already having an impact. Research on the reserve falls into the general areas listed on the slide here on the left, including ecology, evolution and conservation, land management practices, hydrology and ecological restoration, remote sensing, which has a very strong program here at UC Merced, rural health and the environment, as well as arts and the humanities. And research often involves undergraduate students and even more recently members of the Merced community. So um, I'll go back to this. Here you see a flyer on the right from a successful series of community science days where the public came out to the reserve to help researchers collect soil samples for environmental DNA analysis to detect the presence of all kinds of species ranging from bacteria to threatened plants to passing bats, which is really pretty cool. And I also want to give you a few other examples of really cool research projects happening on the reserve. So first there's Daniel Taves shown on the upper right, who's a PhD graduate student in Pro Professor Jay Sexton's ecology lab. And he's studying selective processes that influence plant distribution in vernal pools. And he's using meadow foam, which we mentioned was that first flowering plant you'll see in vernal pools in spring as a target species to investigate how abiotic selective processes influence plant distribution in vernal pools. 
And Daniel's interesting in that he started out at UC Merced as an undergraduate student. He's a local to uh, Merced. And he was so fascinated by vernal pools, he decided to get his PhD study in vernal pool ecology. So he's looking at some of the abiotic factors that uh, would influence um, plant communities in these vernal pools, including geographic and ecological complexities, such as slope and aspect of, of the topography that we talked about on the reserve, like Nima Mound topography, soil type. We have three different major soil types on the reserve. Vernal pool hydro period, which is how long and how much of a vernal pool is inundated with water and so forth. And he's also conducting an experiment on natural selected selection by selectively thinning the meadow plant, uh, meadow foam plants to determine how they respond to more or less floral competition in his research plots. And that, that project was a seven year study. Um, next, I want to share with you a two-year study that's also happening on the reserve that's being conducted by Jacob Neslidge, who's a master's graduate student in Professor Aaron Hester's Earth Observation and Remote Sensing Lab, or EORS, and he's testing the feasibility of unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, or drone technology for short, based on the use of image spectroscopy, which basically evaluates the wavelengths and frequency of radiation from hyperspectral imagery, which uses um, just a ton of different spectral bands to quantify plant biodiversity and identify and track invasive plant species on the reserve as well, um, which is really important for managers like me. And Jacob's preliminary results are shown on this map on the right, which depicts a species richness model that Jacob developed to determine plant biodiversity on the reserve. And so the areas shown in yellow de depict the highest species richness or biodiversity, and the areas in dark purple depict the lowest species richness or uh, plant biodiversity. In addition, the EORS lab was also able to determine what spectral signatures correspond with various non-native invasive plant species of concern, which in our case would be milk thistle or even yellow star thistle, um, which are really important for land managers to manage because we don't want them to take over and crowd out our native plant biodiversity. Another interesting tidbit about this project is that it was uh, NASA funded, which is pretty cool. And then finally, there's Jorge Montiel Molina's research. Um, who was, he was a recent UC Merced graduate who graduated last spring. And he was a re recent PhD graduate student who was co-advised by Jay Sexton, who runs the plant ecology lab at UC Merced, Caroline Frank, who studies endophytes, uh, which are microbes that live in plant tissue, and Mike Beeman, who teaches and studies microbial ecology and greenhouse gas fluxes. And Jorge studied the central roles that microbial communities, including fungi play in vernal pool ecosystems throughout California, as well as Baja. So this one uh, was larger in scope than just the vernal pool reserve. And he looked at the interspecific relationships that these microbial communities have with other organisms. Um, he looked at vernal pool communities in soils, water, and plant tissues in vernal pools. And on the reserve, he established a transect that you can see on this um, Google, uh, uh, Google Earth map here that represents um, a, a gradient from west to east on the reserve of uh, topography and elevation, where the left part of the reserve typically has 
flatter topography and shallower vernal pools and the eastern part of the reserve has more undulating hill topography and deeper vernal pools with longer um, hydro periods. So he also did the same throughout the state of California and Baja in a more scaled up version of looking at elevational and topographic gradients. And what he found was that that biodiversity of microbes varied by latitudinal gradient, where there's generally more microbial diversity in higher elevations or higher latitude locations that typically receive more rainfall. And generally, there's less biodiversity in lower elevations or in lower latitude locations that typically receive less rainfall. And so with that, I'd like to also tell you a bit about the reserve's educational uh, course field trips that we do. Uh, the university level educational instruction on the reserve is also a big part of what we do. And it provides field experiences that enrich student instruction and that we support college level course field trips that provide rich experiences for courses on campus. We also have our own program on the reserve of undergraduate student naturalist trainings that teach students to be docent naturalists for the reserve, which is a powerful program that I hope to reinstate next spring. We weren't able to do it during the pandemic years and I'm not offering it this year, but I will be offering it next spring. And um, the passion of participating students in this program has really shined through in the past and left students with a lasting impression and enthusiasm with, for the reserve, which is so cool. And finally, we also work with a number of undergraduate interns who are paid student assistants that help with a number of different efforts. And some of the current efforts that these student assistants are working on include website development, outreach via social media, leading natural history tours on the reserve, conducting ecological surveys, um, working with geospatial data to make it more publicly available for researchers through um, our GIS hub, if you're familiar with that, and also working with drone technology for various uh, reserve mapping related efforts. And all of these interns or student assistants that I'm working with um, also include partnerships with other mentors, including the campus director of the Geographic Information Systems Center on campus, um, the campus and UC director of the drone safety program for the state and the campus, as well as the campus biologist who's responsible for various ecological surveys, including threatened and endangered species monitoring. And I'd also like to give you a sense of some of the college level courses that use the reserve for field trips that give students these hands on experiences in this living laboratory and natural setting located right next to campus. Um, so you see this list here, some of the uh, courses that are offered through the University of California Merced that use the reserve include plant biology, flora of California, entomology ended up on that same line, but it's its own course, environmental writing, environmental engineering, geomorphology, and also soils. We do get college level course field trips from other campuses as well. For example, we have an environmental chemistry class that comes out from Merced College. And we also have a plant taxonomy class that comes out from Fresno State. And they've been doing vernal pool herbarium collections for six years straight now. And they will post those um, data online on the California Consortium of Herbaria so it can be available to the public. I'd also love to see other courses use the reserve for field trips, such as perhaps psychology classes who could discuss um, the importance of natural settings for promoting a sense of well-being and mental health or even humanities and art classes 
who could use the reserve to discuss the ways that societies have engaged with the natural world and, and ways in which we depict the natural world through art. Last but not least, and Liz, let me know if I'm running out of time. No, you're fine. Great. <laughs> um, public service or outreach is also a big part of what we do on the reserve, and it's aimed at bringing the community to the UC and the UC to the community. So we host a number of K through 12 school groups from the greater area for field experiences and tours, mostly around spring wildflower season, but also in fall. Uh, and class field trips right now are mostly opportunistic in that they're aimed at teachers who um, know about the reserve and typically come out to the reserve, but we'd love to be more strategic and far reaching moving forward. Um, we also offer public tours such as wildflower walks or naturalist trainings. Um, and we partner with a number of on and off campus partners like CalTeach, um, I offer I will be offering a California naturalist certification next year, which should be neat. And then um, I'd like to end with just sharing a little bit about our vision for the future. So um, particularly for local Central Valley youth, I, we'd like to send the message to youth and their families in the greater Central Valley community that where you live is special. You don't have to go far all the way to Yosemite National Park to experience the outdoors, although I would highly recommend it, because there are amazing natural landscapes right here in your own backyard, as shown by this image on the left here of spectacular wildflower blooms and springs. So part of our um, vision for the future specifically is that we want to engage youth and the community to appreciate, understand, and engage with nature through learning about natural landscapes in your own backyard. We want to expand hands-on curriculum uh, to do that. And secondly, we want to inspire and empower next generations of leadership leaders through environmental stewardship, education and career opportunities, and also by teaching about green, sustainable and emerging technologies. Um, and third, we wanna create multi-scale social and environmental change where um, I'd love it if the reserve became the place for vernal pool research, that would be really neat. We also want to triple the number of local K through 12 students served. And finally, we want to really increase our focus on underserved communities and really focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion. So with that, I'd really like to thank you all for listening today and also encourage you to check us out online. We're also on social media. Right now, our webpage is vernalpools.ucmerced.edu. But coming soon, we are going to have a new imp and improved website that will redirect straight from the old website, and that will be mvpgr.ucmerced.edu. And if you're a student listening to this today and you're potentially interested in UC Merced attendance, you can check out go to ucmerced.tumblr. Dot com, which is UC Merced's admissions social media page. Um, and for social media for the reserve, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So check us out. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. This was a fabulous introduction to, I wasn't aware of everything that you're doing down at UC Merced and Vernal Pools to this extent. So thank you so much. Um, and I would love to get um, my botany class on the field trip list. And if so maybe we Absolutely. can <laughs> chat very soon and um, work that out because that would be amazing. And I have a feeling that our zoology class would also probably want to join in also. So. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, one question was, what's the current state of the vernal pools 
with the drought conditions? Such a good question. So as you know, we're in yet another year of drought uh, because vernal pools are rainwater driven seasonal wetlands. They're not faring so well in these drought years, but they are hanging in there. We're getting uh, the period of inundations a lot shorter in the drought years. So this year we had a really big rain event in late December that brought heavy snowpack to the Sierra Nevada mountains and big rainfall to the vernal pool reserve. We do have over 6,000 vernal pool features on the reserve, which you can see on my Zoom background here. Um, and this year, maybe only a third of those pools filled and they only stayed filled until about early February. And now they are in their flowering phase, but we think um, the flowering might be done by early April this year, a little early. Good and question. Then, yeah, and kind of a follow up on that, like how does that impact, for example, life cycle for the fairy shrimp? Great question and absolutely so. In these drought years, the fairy shrimp have a very short uh, period by which to accomplish their life cycle. And I think they need 10 to 60 days to be able to uh, reproduce and lay eggs. And then um, they go dormant. So if they don't have that amount of time, then they would die off and they, the next round of cysts would have to wait until the following year to try to reproduce. But I'm no yeah. fairy shrimp expert. That's my understanding. <laughs> well, it seems like they are set up for success with that time span on with life cycle. And, you know, but when the drought is really severe and so many pools are dried up, I can see that that starts to impact their numbers probably over time. Um, and then one other question, um, prerequisites for some of your programs, like, could an MJC student perhaps do any volunteer work at UC Merced at your at your at the vernal pools? Yeah, I think we could arrange for some kind of opportunity like that. One partnership that we have right now that's a neat career pipeline opportunity is we're partnership we're partnering with CART down in Clovis near Fresno. And CART stands for the Center for Advanced Research and Technology. And that's a program for local high school students to engage in research in a natural setting. So they're doing a research project on the reserve right now where they're studying water quality in the vernal pools and stock ponds and relating that to invertebrate biodiversity and California tiger salamander presence. So there's definitely different opportunities to be had. That's terrific. That's great to know. Let me refresh this over here and just make sure I'm not missing any sure. questions. A couple of times we've had, I've refreshed later on and we've been done and I missed people's questions. Now, I think we're good for today. Um, I appreciate those questions that came in and um, thank you so much for your presentation today. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank, thank you, Joy. It was wonderful. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Denise, and it was my honor to speak as part of the science colloquium today. Yeah. Is it okay if we keep your the recording of your talk on the science colloquium channel? You bet. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Well, goodbye, everybody. Um, this is it for colloquium until fall of 2022, but we will be back and we are hoping to be in person and also stream our programs. So um, I hope you'll join us in the fall and have a good rest of your spring semester. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.